Good morning. I'm Cindy Arnson, the director of the Latin American program at the Wilson Center, and I am delighted to welcome you to this discussion with two leading figures of the Venezuelan democratic opposition, Leopoldo Lopez and Miguel Pizarro. I'll introduce them briefly in a moment, but first I want to, con I want to highlight the context for their visit to Washington, D.C. Last April, opposition parties and civic organizations in Venezuela came together under the umbrella of the Democratic Unity Platform Alliance. Then, in May, the Uni Unity Platform called for a process of negotiations to, quote, alleviate the suffering of our people, contribute to the reinstitutionalization of the country with an electoral timetable with conditions that permit Venezuelans to freely decide our future. Unquote. The government of Norway is leading an effort to establish the basis for talks between the Venezuelan opposition and the Nicolás Maduro regime. Such attempts have faltered in the past, and this despite the desire of Venezuelans and many nations around the world for a peaceful political resolution to Venezuela's deep, multiple, and overlapping crises, humanitarian, political, economic, and social. The conversation will be guided today by Ambassador Mark Green, the president and CEO of the Wilson Center, a former director of USAID, a former member of Congress, former U.S. ambassador to Tanzania. Joining him are two close colleagues of Venezuela's interim president, Juan Guaido. Leopoldo Lopez is one of Venezuela's most famous opposition politicians, and he is a founder, together with Juan Guaido, of the Voluntad Popular Party. He served two four-year terms as the mayor of Chacao, a municipality of Caracas. Lopez was perhaps the most visible face of the mass protests against the Maduro government in 2014. He was charged with incitement and spent three years in Maduro's prisons before being released to house arrest in 2017. He currently lives in exile in Spain. Miguel Pizarro is a former student leader and was elected to the Venezuelan National Assembly in 2010 at the ripe old age of 21. He was re-elected in 2015, the landmark year in which the opposition gained control of Venezuela's National Assembly. Mr. Pizarro presided over the Assembly's Social Development Committee. He is a member of the Primero Justicia Party and currently serves as interim president Juan Guaido's ambassador to the United Nations. Ambassador Green, over to you. Thanks, Cindy and Leopoldo. Miguel, it's good to see you both. And for you, it's been 10 years. How do you find Washington uh, as you, you come back here? A lot has changed. Well, first of all, I want to thank you. Uh, thank the Wilson Center and thank you personally for everything that you've done for Venezuela. Uh, the commitment that, that you've shown for many years now. Um, and uh, you asked me, you know, what, what's the main difference? And I think that the main difference is that 10 years ago, we were talking about Venezuela still as a, um, an experiment of democracy. Uh, yeah. There were still some people talking about Venezuela as a, as a democracy um, that was tropical democracy. And today, for me, it's very clear that everybody understands that Venezuela is a dictatorship. And that was a very important shift. In 2013, we had a, an internal discussion um, in our team, and we had that discussion about is, it, is Venezuela a democracy or a dictatorship? And we concluded that it was a dictatorship. And that's when we decided to go out and organize uh, um, street protests, um, nonviolent, of course, and that's what took me to prison. And that's why I was sentenced to 14 years in prison. I spent seven years um, without freedom, and now it's very clear to the world, at least to, to the democratic world, that Venezuela is a dictatorship. Unfortunately for Venezuelans, this is not only a political problem. Uh, it's a dictatorship that has uh, traduced to Venezuelan people as suffering, hunger, despair, and exodus of millions of Venezuelans. So I think that the main difference is that now everybody understands that this is a dictatorship. And of course, I see the challenge that we all have, how to manage a dictatorship at, in the heart, at the very heart 
of um, the American continent. And something that we said for many years, I think it's become clear. Venezuela is not a problem of Venezuelans. Venezuela is going to have an impact in the entire region. And I believe that uh, some people thought that we were exaggerating uh, years ago when we said this. And today it's very clear that Venezuela is a problem uh, uh, in, in many respects to the entire continent. Well, uh, first off, we're proud to host you. Uh, we're proud of the work of our Latin America program, Cindy's leadership, and, and all that it stands for. Uh, we're not your only stop. You've had good meetings on Capitol Hill, both sides of the aisle, both of you. How have those meetings gone? What, what's the message that you've delivered? And what have you heard back from members of Congress? Well, I think Venezuela, it's, a, it, it's, it's a, an issue that here in Washington, I believe it might be one of the very few issues that is bipartisan. And, and we have been working on that. Our Ambassador Carlos Vecchio uh, has been very clear in the importance of maintaining the case of Venezuela as uh, bipartisan. And I think that there is a lot of alignment uh, among Democrats and Republicans uh, about the problem that we are all facing with Venezuela. So we had meetings uh, at the Senate, Congress, uh, White House, um, state and some think tanks. And I think that um, we all need to keep unity uh, around the issue of Venezuela. We hope that Venezuela does not become a problem that divides uh, the opinion here in the United States, but that, it, it, that it's an issue that unites. Uh, because in the end, what we need is a solution to a political problem that has become a humanitarian crisis. Yeah, I mean, I think getting support uh, or maintaining support of people like Senator Menendez is obviously crucial. Menendez and Meeks, uh, if they offer their support, then that, that really tells you you're on firm footing here in Washington on Capitol Hill. Yeah, we actually met with uh, Senator Menendez uh, and Senator Rubio. I think both of them have shown a great deal of leadership in, in terms of uh, pulling together a bipartisan understanding of the case of Venezuela. And they... Uh, push the Verdad Act, which is a policy guideline for the United States uh, as to how to approach the, the, the crisis in Venezuela. We also met with uh, Congressman Mix, and he was very clear in the support of what we are asking, because um, we are asking for something very concrete. We want free and fair elections. And this is not an ideological issue. This is not an issue of the right or the left. Uh, this is an issue that all Democrats should support. And uh, Congressman Mix was uh, very clear in his support. And he said it many times in our meeting. He said, um, I, I have been and I will continue to support free and fair elections mm -hmm. in Venezuela. You had meetings with the State Department, the administration. Uh, again, message you, you delivered and what did you hear back? Well, um, what we uh, are presenting here is um, uh, a, an approach, a way forward for the Venezuelan crisis that we've been working um, in Venezuela. We've been uniting all the political sectors and civil society in Venezuela around uh, the very concrete way forward um, that is about pushing a negotiation that will lead to two objectives. The first is to have the alignment to address the humanitarian crisis. And second is to uh, have a timeline for presidential and parliamentary elections. And um, what we have been putting together is the unity of not just the political sectors in Venezuela, but also of the countries that are supporting uh, the, the political uh, crisis in Venezuela. Because there is a lot of talk about unity, uh, and a lot of that burden is on our shoulders, and we assume that, and we have uh, that responsibility, and we're working to unify all the sectors in Venezuela. But that's also a responsibility of the countries that are supporting us. We need unity of Europe and the United States and the countries in, in the region. And we also need unity uh, in think tanks and in opinion makers, in people that uh, need to understand that we need to unify all the forces to push forward for this idea or, or this commitment to free and fair elections in Venezuela. So I'll ask this of you both. Uh, so if I'm a skeptic, and I hear you talking about negotiation. Why shouldn't I say, ah, oh, we've seen talk of negotiation before. Negotiation has never worked. Why does it work this time? What, what's the difference? 
Why should we be more optimistic about the opportunities for negotiation? Well, as you say, Mark, um, we've, been, we've gone through uh, this process several times before. So we have some lessons learned. And mm -hmm. there are two main lessons that I would like to uh, address. The first one is that in order for a negotiation to be successful, we need to focus on a very concrete objective. The previous negotiations were an open book. Uh, so everything was on the table. So it was a very long agenda, and that led to uh, not a reaching to an agreement on anything. So that's the first lesson, and we are focusing in um, having a very concrete objective, free and fair elections. And the second is the engagement of the United States and the international community. Right. In all the previous processes, uh, it was a negotiation among Venezuelans. And some people use this to say, well, this is an issue that Venezuelans need to deal with, and let's let Venezuelans deal with it. But the reality, unfortunately for us, is that the crisis in Venezuela is not a crisis of Venezuelans. It's a geopolitical crisis where we have the participation and the involvement of very powerful countries that are supporting Maduro. I believe that one of the answers to why Maduro is still in power in Venezuela is because of the support that he has gotten from China, Russia, Turkey, Iran, Cuba. Uh, and in order to counterweight uh, that support that Maduro has in, in Venezuela, uh, we need the leadership of the United States. United States needs to be uh, engaged. United States needs to lead. Uh, and, and I will even go as far as saying that if the United States does not engage in this process, um, there is no possibility that this process um, will be successful. And that has been our main message uh, to the Senate, to the Congress, and to the State Department. So Miguel, I, I know you have communications with the UN and UN members. Uh, similar message, and what do you hear back from them? What do you think is out there from them? Yeah, Mark, I believe first now is a broader understanding in the world that what we are living inside of a country and what's happening in the region mm. is not because of two political factions that are unable to find a way out or two political factions that are too radical to recognize each other. Right. Now everyone understands that it's a dictatorship with all the control of the state forces and all, all the state institutions preventing the people from having food, for having medicines, for having civil and political rights. And that understanding have concrete outcomes. When you see the fact-finding mission doing a special investigation related to human rights violation in Venezuela, and they are saying, they are the ones saying that in Venezuela happens crimes against humanity, that the main goal of all the human rights violations is to uh, shut up dissidents, to, to stop the, the political opposition, to be part of a political game, there's a new understanding in the, in the UN system. When you have agencies like the World Food Program starting operation in the ground, then you start to see as a real and a concrete outcome that everyone understands that one of each three people in Venezuela right now live under food insecurity. When you force inside of a system discussions about access to COVAX or what we are doing right now, that is on frozen funds to be able to fund the cold chain and the rollout of the vaccination, and the regime is the one trying to politicize, now our, there's a different understanding of our humanitarian uh, priorities inside of a country. And I believe among the UN system, there's a key challenge in the future. How the political part of the UN system plays a constructive and useful role in a Venezuelan solution. How the humanitarian part of the UN plays an active role during negotiations and help the Venezuelans during political talks to have a parallel track of humanitarian space and humanitarian agreements can scale up the level of response internally. But also, and, and going back to unity, we understand that after two years of this process, there is a need of evolution in the conversation. There is a need of, of, of concrete results in, in the conversation. And that's why we are making this kind of, of, of assessment of where we are right now. It's not the same regime that we had two years ago inside of the UN. The first time I came here for an ONGA in 2018, the same year Fernando Alban was killed after going back from that ONGA, Maduro had red carpet, had an event in Harlem, was the main guy for a lot of side events. Two years after, no one wants to do a side event with Maduro. Delegation doesn't want to have a picture with the regime, mm. and all the bodies from the UN understands that all the humanitarian emergency is man-made, and all the crimes against humanity and the human rights violations have a political agenda and political strategy. What we need now, Mark, unity. Yeah. 
the international community aiming for the same goal, that is having real negotiations for real elections and scaling up in the humanitarian response. So I want to pick up on something you said. Uh, so uh, there are lots of bad news coming out of Venezuela over the years, obviously, great human suffering. And yet just recently, a few glimmers of hope. You point to the World Food Program, uh, Governor Beasley, who, who, a great leader of the World Food Program, and some cooperation on COVID, uh, some ability to get those uh, deliveries. Uh, is that something that can be built on? Do you see the possibilities of expanding on the humanitarian side? What we're doing, Mark, we took the decision two years ago that humanitarian response had not to be linked to the political situation. And we took the decision from the interim government and the opposition forces to work both tracks in parallel and trying to find all the support and to ease all the suffering possible from the Venezuelans while we are able to find a political way out. And that means that we are open to have conversations related to humanitarian response without linking that to a political uh, strategy. That has been able to, for us to open new spaces with the agencies and with the agencies and international community force the regime to open a different interaction. That doesn't mean that the regime wants to solve the humanitarian situation. Because for the regime, the humanitarian catastrophe right now is a dream world. If you have a country locked down because of COVID and the people going around for food and medicines is, is the dream world for a dictatorship. That's why we understand that easing the suffering and providing assistance is also a way to free the people and to be the people able to say what they think. What I believe the regime have now is, is a, a, a moment of decisions. The regime is being forced to say in front of the world if they want food security and food assistance inside of a country or don't. If they want vaccines or don't. If they want uh, the water sanitation program in place or don't. And that discussion is a whole different discussion. Right. Because when it was simplified in the political terms, it was always seems like part of a position where too hardliner and trying to force. There's a narrative on the regime that says that we were trying to force people suffering to build an uprise to change the political uh, reality in the country. And we are not that. We are in this mainly and precisely because we are against that. We are against the people suffering mm -hmm. because of political reasons. And that's the regime game. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, of course, I was at USAID at the time. And we always wanted to get humanitarian assistance directly to the Venezuelan people. But it was Maduro and the political games and the political system that stopped us from doing it. But if you can get those narrow open spaces with a great organization like WFP, I think you'll find a lot of people will rally to the cause. Uh, Leopoldo, let me ask uh, something. You pointed out something that I think we sometimes forget here in the States. These are not merely negotiations, unified Maduro and uh, hopefully unified opposition. There are other players involved. Russia and Iran and China and Turkey and Cuba. You will remember there were rumors at one point that uh, Mr. Maduro was actually on a plane and ready to leave. And uh, his uh, taskmaster said, no, I, I don't think so. Go back. How do you see uh, dealing with the challenge but also the realities of these other forces, these other players? How do they... Uh, get involved or, or how do you cover them when it comes to negotiations? Well, I think that there is a, a conversation that needs to happen, which is ab about the conflict that is very clear in Latin America and very, very clear in Venezuela um, between authoritarianism and democracy. And, and that is happening. And Venezuela is, uh, is a laboratory of uh, the uh, influence that these authoritarian regimes are taking in Latin America. And it's very clear that all of these countries have different interests in Venezuela. Um, China uh, has an economic interest, um, Russia more geopolitical with the military um, relationship that they have with the regime, Turkey, they have a, a relationship through the extraction and the refining of gold, Iran with energy and military supply, but they all are uh, supporting the dictatorship. And we believe that um, in order to have a successful negotiation, 
a, one of the elements is to bring in these countries to the process because they are stakeholders. Whether we like it or not, these countries are there and they uh, impose a great deal of influence in the Maduro regime. And the only way in which these countries can be brought into this process is through the diplomacy of the United States and Europe. Uh, because uh, they they need to be uh, to have a counterweight, and that is why we have been insistent in in the importance of the U.S. leadership in this process. Uh, if a hands-off uh, approach to the negotiations from the U.S. government um, will lead to a failed negotiation again. But the engagement of the United States, uh, understanding that part of the negotiation is to engage with all of these countries, can lead us to a successful negotiation. And again, what we are asking for is free and fair elections. Mm. And this is a non-ideological issue. Um, this is an issue that needs to cross the borders between the left and the right, uh, not just in the United States, but also in Europe and elsewhere, because this is the core of a democratic value, which is free and fair election. So uh, I think you've touched on some very important issues. So uh, as you're saying, we all recognize that whether we like it or not, there are players and stakeholders involved, and to ignore them guarantees failure, right? There's no possible way. So let me take it one step further. What do you say to Maduro supporters about their future if, in fact, you can have successful negotiation, if, in fact, you can have free and fair elections should they fight to the last moment, or what's, what does Venezuela look like for them? Well, hopefully a negotiation precisely is about uh, putting together a way forward that talks about guarantees for everybody. Guarantees that will lead to stability, starting with political stability, which will have an influence in economic and therefore social uh, stability. And uh, it's about giving guarantees to uh, the people who are now supporting Maduro and understanding that we are better off as a country if we agree in, uh, in, in the possibility of having, again, free and fair elections. Um, the, supporting, the support of Maduro today is, is very low in the country. Unfortunately, many Venezuelans today are disengaged with politics because they are um, engaged in their day-to-day -day survival. Mm. So we need to um, express that this is an opportunity to save Venezuela and to put together um, the, the, a possibility for the well-being of all the Venezuelan people. But the, the, the starting point for all this is to put together the negotiation, to start the negotiation, to make it very clear what's the objective that we all have in mind, and to have all the stakeholders understand that everybody needs to contribute to this process. It's not easy, and it's not going to be easy. Uh, but we believe that uh, with the engagement of the international community in a way that is different from all the previous processes uh, can increase the probabilities for success uh, in, in this process. And also, Mark, may I jump in quickly? There's two broader understandings also. First, we are not aiming only for an electoral and humanitarian solution for the short term. What we are telling to the countries and what we are telling in these negotiations is that we understand that what we are going to build now and what we are trying to build now in negotiations is the country that we're going to have for the next 30 or 50 years. So that means that also we understand that there is part of a regime that is going to continue existing inside of a country. It's not that we are uh, planning to erase the other part of a political world inside of a country. We understand that for them you need not only guarantees, you also need to build the right incentive. Uh, for example, for the stakeholders in the international community for the regime, there's no way to have the payment of the debt if the country continues right. in, the way the, in the way it is right now. They're going to lose all the military influence they have and a strategical point uh, of view if the country continues in the way it is because Maduro does not ensure integrity of the territory. They are going to lose all the influence in the multilateral world because they are helping a guy who is destroying the region. So for the stakeholders of the regime, there's also a wide range of incentive, a wide range of conversations that we need to engage with and trying to show to them that the only way for them to have their interests preserved is to have a different reality inside of a country and a different future in the way. So uh, I will say as, uh, as someone who has been a close observer for a while, 
what I am hearing that is different than what I had heard it before is a recognition that the future of Venezuela has to be a future for everyone, right? No, absolutely. And, and that, that has always been uh, our view. Um, we have been fighting for elections for many years. I was in prison for four years in a military prison. I was confined for seven years. And in 2015, um, I'm, I'm, along with other people, I went to a hunger strike, 28 days. I lost 14 kilos, and it was 100 of us that were in a hunger strike in, in different prisons and also outside uh, in, in different plazas. Guaido was one of the people that was also in a hunger strike. So we, we have a commitment that we're willing to take um, to, to very high levels of commitment to, to, to make this happen. And this has always been uh, our understanding to the solution of the Venezuelan crisis. One thing, another thing that I don't think is well understood sometimes uh, here in the U.S., when we, uh, when I was at USAID and we took a look at the economic infrastructure in Venezuela, it, it is hard to convey how broken it is. Uh, I think sometimes there is the sense that uh, we have an election on Tuesday and on Wednesday everything's okay. And it's going to take years to restore the petroleum-based economy. It's going to be years to equip hospitals and get things out. Do you think that the Venezuelan people uh, understand that this is a long-term challenge that is not only everything that you are saying to create the, the conditions, but that a lot of work will need to be done, a lot of cooperation will need to be done to rebuild something which is at one time was the shining star of the region and now has fallen and collapsed into uh, great depths of darkness. Yeah, Mark, I, I believe there is a big understanding inside of a country that any rebuilding process is going to take time. What everyone is desperately in need is to have the hope that that time is starting. And that time is not going to start while Maduro is in power. There's a, a bad approach, I believe, in certain parts of the conversation in this city and in Europe sometimes that say that maybe Maduro is what we have. And we should clean the cage, not try to open the cage to let the people out. And trying to have better conditions, but with Maduro there. And that is simply impossible to do because while Maduro remains in power, all the scaling up of assistance, all the access to international credit, all the insurance that the, the world economy needs from a country to be part of that financial system is not going to be in place. But also what happened right now with the few economical activity we have in the country. The gold is in the hand of the ANSACs. All the gold structuring in our country is in the hands of, of non-state alarmed groups. What happens in the south of the Orinoco River is the presence of ELN, FARC, Venezuelan guerrillas, and this sindicato that is people dealing with the mafia from the jail. What happens with the diesel and the fuel is in the hands of the army. And there's a huge parallel market in which if you have 100 bucks in your pocket, you can find whatever you want. What happened with the economical bubbles? Why 98% of the country doesn't have the money to buy food, less than $1 per month as a wage. There's 2% of the country who can live with $2,000 per month in a bubble of economy, and that bubble of economy, sadly, is the places of the city in which media, diplomats, and a bunch of people live. So yeah. you can get easily confused between what you see in Caracas and in five blocks around your embassy or your media outlet and what happens three hours away in a car. Right now, people, we, we are speaking with the refugees in the other side of the border. The first thing they said is, I didn't have food for my kids. I didn't have medicine for my elders. They are, they are going away for basic needs. And when you ask them about the political situation, all of them are raising only one solution. No more Maduro. Oh. And for that, free and fair elections is the only yeah, way. So let me, let me so I, I've tried to give you a pessimistic message. Now let me give you an optimistic message. What strikes me about Venezuela that is different than many other places in the world, many other refugee and migrant crises in the world, uh, when I've spoken to Venezuelans who are living e either in Colombia or in the U.S., I ask them, uh, do you want to go back? They're, Absolutely. Yeah. Oftentimes we find that people who are forced to flee, they turn the page and they say, that's it, we're done, we're never going back. 
Venezuelans I meet all say, we want to go back. We're Venezuelan. That's our home, and we believe in the future. And uh, I've been struck by, uh, particularly in Florida, but not solely in Florida, a number of well-educated professionals, uh, doctors and nurses, who already do charity care, but they have told me that they are ready to go back and they're ready to rebuild. And so while the economy is in a shambles and in a dark place, I think there is a there is a an army of compassion, as it is said, that uh, can get to work and do things. I mean, I'm I'm assuming that you are in touch with these people all the time. And I can share with you a, a short personal story. After two years, I, I am already two years in exile. The last time I saw my mom was the day the Supreme Court sentenced me. I was in my mom's place near her but before going to hiding. I spent two months hiding. And I saw my mom after two years. The first question of everyone to my mom was, and you're going back? And the answer from my mom is yes. Because someone has to be there for the moment the door is open for my son to go back. And that's my mom, who have lived raids, who have lived police harassment. But that's the kind of hope that Venezuelan moms and Venezuelan brothers, sisters have. We believe in our future. And we understand that we have an, a clear path to have the future we want. In the moment the Venezuelans are able to choose, in the moment we are able to vote, free, to vote freely, that's going to be the last day of this part of the nightmare we are living. And we're going to enter in a whole different ballgame. It's going to be the rebuilding, and it's going to be, without any doubt, uh, an, uh, a difficult future. But it's going to be a whole different ballgame than the one we have right now. Well, Venezuela is not going to be the country we were. And I think that's uh, something that we need to settle with. Uh, there are a lot of people that try to approach the future by looking back into what Venezuela was before. We're not going to be the same country for many, many, many reasons. Unfortunately, our country has become the poorest country in the continent, according to the IMF, even below uh, IT. Uh, and that's a reality that we will need to deal with for, for many years. We hope that Venezuela is not the country that we are today. But the country that we are going to be is going to be impacted greatly by the millions of Venezuelans that have left. And we believe that this is going to be an opportunity, as you say, because not, not all of them will go back. But we hope that many of them will have contact with Venezuela. There is a lot of talent. There will be a lot of capital. There will be a lot of entrepreneurship. There will be a lot of understanding of how the world is working in order to construct that new Venezuela. So. Part of our challenge is to organize the Venezuelan diaspora uh, and organize them ho with uh, around a very hopeful idea of uh, committing with the construction of that Venezuela for the future. So um, we, we are optimistic. We, we, we need to be optimistic um, in terms of what will be the future of Venezuelans if we bring about change. However, all the programs about education, health, security, infrastructure, um, uh, or and anything, it has a starting point, freedom. Without freedom, none of that will happen, and none of those dreams could be accomplished. And that is why we will continue to fight for freedom in Venezuela. Um, we hear sometimes that there is fatigue around the Venezuelan issue. And we understand that sometimes we have been uh, a high priority in the news. Um, and at other moments, Venezuela has become a, a lower priority in, in, the, in public opinion. However, the suffering continues. Right. The people continue to die. Millions of people continue to cross the border. Uh, so we cannot be fatigued by uh, the situation in Venezuela. We do have a challenge to keep uh, Venezuela as a priority in the minds and hearts of people that will need to contribute to, to, that to, to a to change. That was my question. So, you know, I, I'm very proud, of, and again, we've known each other for a while. I'm very proud of the work that we've done together. Uh, during the Trump administration as $1.2 billion humanitarian development assistance for Venezuelans inside the country, but around the region. And uh, I'm guessing that Mr. Maduro was disappointed that the Biden administration also provided <laughs> new money. So it is a continuation, uh, as you've said, uh, bipartisan. But given the resources that have gone in, given the challenges that American foreign policy sees in so many parts of the world, Message to the average, everyday American, why should we care? Why does Venezuela matter to us? Why, why should we continue 
to provide assistance and support to Venezuela. When I was uh, when I was in prison in 2015, President Obama signed uh, the executive order saying that Venezuela was uh, a threat to uh, the security of, of America. So that started with Obama. And then the Trump administration, of course, continued with, uh, with, with that understanding that Venezuela was actually a threat. And Venezuela is a threat. Venezuela is at the heart of the American continent. Venezuela today uh, uh, is living under a dictatorship that is being supported by countries that are adversaries, some of them declared enemies of the United States, and that they have a very clear um, um, commitment to destroy democracies, not just in Venezuela, but elsewhere. For many years, we said that the crisis in Venezuela was going to affect other countries in the region. Now, I think many people understand that that is true, because unfortunately, Venezuela is exporting a model of poverty, is exporting a model of uh, authoritarianism, and it's also, it's also exporting a model of a criminal economy. You asked about the economy in Venezuela. And I think to understand uh, or, or the reality, the economic reality in Venezuela today, um, we cannot um, analyze it with uh, um, traditional tools because what is happening is that we have um, a dark economy, like you have the internet and the dark web. And the economy in Venezuela is an illicit economy. And in order to understand the political economy of Venezuela, you need to understand the gold trade. You need to understand what is happening with uh, cocaine trafficking. You need to understand what is happening with uh, the, the smuggling. You need to understand the relationship with uh, non-armed groups. You need to understand the relationship with organized crime all over the place. You need to or or understand what is happening with cryptocurrencies in Venezuela that has become, according to some, the fourth largest mining uh, country that, uh, that, uh, for, for cryptocurrency. So that, that, that's the underlying reality uh, of our economy, and, and, and that is affecting the rest of the region, and it's affecting and will continue to affect the United States. And I'll give you another, another um, answer to that question, why Americans should care. Migration is a priority for the American people and for the U.S. government. Last year, there were less than 200 people that crossed the border uh, from Mexico to the United States. Uh, I understand that at this moment, more than 20,000 people have crossed the border uh, from Rio Grande to the United States. And that's going to continue. So if migration is a priority uh, for the United States, well, Venezuela needs to be dealt with. And I give you another issue that, uh, that is of importance. Uh, for this administration, uh, the environment is of high priority. Well, Venezuela today is undergoing the main uh, environmental destruction in the entire continent that is affecting one of the most fragile places in the entire world, that is Canaima National Park. So if corruption is a, a priority for the American people and for the U.S. government, government Venezuela is a hub of uh, corruption and organized crime. If human rights is a priority for the American people, well, Venezuela today is one of the countries that is showing um, the darkest record in human rights. This is not something that we are saying. This is something that the UN, Michelle Bachelet, is saying. And um, in the upcoming days and weeks, we might be hearing from this, the International Criminal Court uh, about the opening of a case against Maduro for violating human rights and committing crimes against humanity in Venezuela. So all the issues that are of, important, uh, of importance to this administration and to the American people, corruption, environment, uh, human rights, migration, you have all of these issues uh, in Venezuela. Uh, Miguel, d do you think that there is a recognition when you speak to uh, UN members and, and the UN itself, do they appreciate the impact of the Venezuelan crisis on all these issues like the environment, uh, you know, from fisheries to illicit mining, is there an appreciation of that? Absolutely, Mark. And and there is not only good understanding internally, now you have reports. For example, the international uh, body to fiscalize the drugs and, and in Vienna mm -hmm. was the one saying in their report that the Cartel de los Soles, these high-ranked members of the army drug cartel, exist. 
and that part of the truck that is uh, kept by the security forces in Venezuela simply disappeared from the reports, and that means mm -hmm. it ends in, in a different place. What happens in the Human Rights Council? Venezuela is one of the few countries with special procedures. We have the fact-finding mission doing investigation, and we have the High Commissioner doing reports. But also, Mark, I believe is a, there's a good understanding now uh, between the state members that Venezuela is an origin, uh, a country in, uh, looking for an origin solution. Because mm -hmm. while longer it takes, deeper is the crisis. And, and going back a bit for, for why America should care about it, and it's the same in the UN. Maybe if you are not into the, the biggest subjects of politics, right. think in two numbers. Four of each 10 kids in Venezuela are not growing in the way it should because they don't have food and water. Eight of 10 people doesn't find the medicines they need yeah. because they're simply not available in the country and where they found it, it's impossible to pay it. So I I even in the most basic way to approach, Venezuela needs an urgent care and an urgent involvement, not only from the governments, also from the societies. Part of what we're doing is also running think tanks, youth movements, universities, because this is way beyond only institutional engagement. What we need is a broader movement. You know, um, I'll just add to that. So what I found striking in my USAID days is that diseases that we all thought were conquered reappeared. Reappeared. And, and Mark, for example, during your administration yeah. in USAID, uh, you started the only immunization program we have right now in Venezuela. The only vaccination we have in the country right now is paid by the international cooperation because the regime haven't paid the debt with the revolving fund of PAHO since seven years ago. So if, if, if only because of international solidarity that we have vaccines, that we have food, that we have the basic needs we have inside of the country. Well, again, I think we are fortunate. Uh, WFP, I think, is, uh, I think gives us some confidence in the way that they administer Agreed. assistance. I think that's very helpful. And so obviously, if you're able to negotiate with the government, even those small spaces for humanitarian relief, then it's good for humanity and, uh, and very good. So uh, thank you for coming. You've had a very successful time here in D.C. My guess is that some in Caracas are deeply disappointed. They were hoping <laughs> that you would get lots of bad news. But the fact that you get uh, supportive messages from the administration, from Democrats on the Hill, Republicans on the Hill, uh, I think that's very good news. So it's been a good and successful trip. Thank you, Mark. Any final words? Any? Well, final I, I, again, I want to thank you, thank the, the Wilson Center, uh, and, and ask you to keep Venezuela as a priority for the people of Venezuela. Uh, you said that we are getting support, uh, and we don't want support for us as individuals or for our political parties. Mm -hmm. We want support for the solution to the crisis that millions of people are suffering today. And, and, and that's what we need uh, to be engaged with, and we are very thankful for the, the commitment that has been shown by the U.S. government, Senate, Congress, think tanks, and, and we hope that continues. Well, uh, the Wilson Center, the Latin America program, you've heard from Cindy, we're on it. And we will continue to uh, try to talk about these matters and make sure that people are aware of both challenges and opportunities and an exciting path ahead. Congratulations on a successful trip, but Godspeed with uh, the months and years ahead. We're with you. Thank you. Thank Mark. you. Thank, Thank you. you.